Uh, hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Okay, two headlines, seven months apart. This one from Benjamin Cowan here on Twitter. Bitcoin could plunge 70% to $5,000, Standard Chartered predicts. Impossible 2023 surprise. Now, this was published uh, in December of 2022. We got to remember where the market was at that point in time. Let me just read you the headline from a couple of days ago. I talked about this headline yesterday. Bitcoin is set to quadruple to $120,000 by the end of 2024, Standard Chartered says. So an interesting turn of events, of course. In December of 2022, specifically uh, December 5th, 2022, uh, Bitcoin was trading in and around here, okay? The depths of the market. Let me zoom in here uh, to show you guys where we were at that point in time. You guys can see uh, just from that uh, headline there, the doom and gloom narrative was very pervasive. Remember, we did not see any of this on the chart yet. So all we were seeing was the down, down, down over the last year, 2022, the bear market. And as of a couple of days ago, Standard Chartered has now changed their tune, assuming now Bitcoin is going to go to $120,000 per coin uh, by late 2024. So uh, I did a bit of an exercise the other day regarding that. Not going to go over that again, but uh, you know, I mean, guys, we are in a bull market. We are seeing higher highs. We are seeing higher lows and we have been for the last uh, six, seven months. So guys, that is positive news. Even up here, that is a higher high than this. And that is higher than that. And it looks as though Bitcoin is poised to continue to rally up. Okay. We have seen this pattern formulate here on the uh, on the chart on the daily and uh, it looks as though if we zoom in even further and let me throw it on the hourly let me get rid of that uh, you guys can see even on the hourly the trend looking very very positive moving upward we did see uh, this double bounce too right so the w bottom pattern the double bounce that also suggests that we are going to be moving up not only that christopher inks here on twitter posted this i continue to see charts trying to convince you that max pain for traders is if bitcoin pulls back and then rallies those people just don't get it max pain is already being felt as price has continued to rally from the november low so exactly what i was saying earlier well i mean not with regards to max pain but guys this was the bottom of the market this was max pain this is when uh you know everybody was feeling down and out it was right after the ftx collapse so the narrative was very very negative and, uh, you know, this is when everybody should have been getting into their crypto positions. I have to say I did get into an H bar position at this point in time. Did very, very well. It was a quick trade that I did. Cashed out in early 2023. And then I took some of my profits and I reinvested into some other coins that were still down 90, 95%. Uh, and so he's saying people just don't get it. So many people remain on the sidelines because they're scared that if they jump in, price will drop. You cannot be scared, guys. You have to have faith. And if you want a little sneak peek at what I'm doing, I'm only charging $5 a month. I think it's pretty good value on my Patreon, patreon.com slash working money channel. And you guys can follow uh, what I'm going to be doing in this bull run. I'm going to be posting trades on the days that they occur. I know I've been hitting you guys over the head with the Patreon, but you know, I really want you guys to get into the pay. If you're interested in it, don't wait two, three, four months, because guys, this is going to be too late. Okay. The market is picking up now. And, uh, you know, we're still in a very, very, uh, early phase. I think in the bull market, we're in a good phase right now. Uh, and I think to be honest with you, once we hit the top and we start declining into a bear market, I don't even think I'll be talking about the Patreon and I'll probably even be discouraging people to, <laughs> to join because, you know, in a bear market, we're not going to be making too many trades. We're just going to be reaping our rewards from the bull cycle. So we'll probably be relaxing on beaches and doing stuff like that. Okay. So no max pain. Uh, it's not pulling back and then rallying. Max Payne is price continuing to rally without giving people a deep enough pullback to convince them that they may have a chance to profit if they enter. So essentially, Christopher Inks, uh, you know, saying we're already starting to move up. Max Payne has already occurred. And uh, I mean, guys, just don't be left behind. Rob Art here also mentioning something interesting. What you want to see is stocks and stock indexes set new highs. Bitcoin sets new highs and then alts rally hard. So um, the perfect storm for the crypto space to really kind of move is to also be aware of what the stock market is doing. Uh, and I'm going to throw uh, the SPY, so the spiders here on the weekly, just to give you guys a sense of where the S&P 500 is right now. So we did see it top back in January of 2022. It did come down and it was looking very, very scary uh, there for a while. And now it is looking like it is forming a uh, an inverted head and shoulders pattern. So we're making new highs now. We're almost back up to spring 2022 levels. Uh, so the the market is stock markets. I'm saying the market 
Uh, stock markets are looking fairly good. Cannot say the same for the NASDAQ though, unfortunately. NASDAQ is uh, retesting this bottom here. Again, this is on the weekly. So NASDAQ retesting this bottom. However, the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average is also doing fairly well. Okay, trying to reclaim these highs up here, retesting resistance up here. And the Dow Jones, for instance, is only about 7.8% off its all-time high, which was set back in January of 2022. So that is positive. I mean, if we still, if we continue to see, uh, you know, the S&P 500 and other stock indices, if we continue to see them rally up, uh, like for example, the S&P is only 8.5% off its all-time high. That's also going to encourage uh, crypto traders and the crypto market to really kind of rally. And as Rob Art says here, Bitcoin will set new highs and then alts will also rally hard. So let's take a look at XRP right now. I got XRP here on the weekly. And as you guys can see, uh, not moving too, too much within the last few days, still trading in and around 47 cents. That trend still looking fairly positive though, still moving upward. We got Bitcoin here, Bitcoin uh, up a little bit compared to yesterday. It's trading at around $30,600 per coin. So guys, we're getting there slowly but surely. Ian Bin's also posting this. XRP and SHIB are the most traded currencies on major Indian exchanges. So a lot of volume flowing through XRP and Shiba Inu of all coins, both making the list of the three most traded digital currencies on Wazirex in June, according to a tweet from the exchange. Wazirex uh, has seen these tokens trading hand in hand with Bitcoin, the leading cryptocurrency in terms of market cap and trading volume. So Bitcoin, Shiba Inu and XRP topped the trading charts in June on the platform, making a new trend on the Indian cryptocurrency market. So, uh, you know, cryptocurrency trading is becoming more and more popular globally. I think uh, the US still has the most crypto traders However, you know, the fact that we're seeing uh, XRP specifically being traded, uh, you know, as one of the highest volume trades, you know, you would think that it would be Ethereum just based on, uh, you know, when, when you look up any kind of list of, uh, you know, the top cryptocurrencies, top 10 by market cap, you always get Ethereum there in the number two position, uh, followed by BNB coin and then XRP. You wouldn't think that these people would choose uh, such unusual cryptocurrencies. I mean, I'm sure there's a reason for it. Even considering Wazirex is part of the Binance ecosystem here, mentions it down here, you would think that, you know, maybe Binance coin would be uh, another one that they trade quite a bit. Nevertheless, uh, we're not seeing that. We're seeing Shiba Inu and XRP of all coins. So interesting news there. Tim Draper made his rounds on Bloomberg Crypto, guys, talking about regulation in the U.S. because that's going to also play a big part as to where this market moves. Listen to what Tim Draper had to say here, guys. I have no idea why the SEC would try to go after two groups that are doing everything they can to comply with all the ridiculous regulations that these guys are putting together. And somehow the SEC decides to slap slap them down. I think we need a new yeah. way of thinking at the SEC. This is not Has the SEC contacted America. you about this, Tim? Do regulators have questions no. for you in particular? No. But the but I think they have a problem. And I think it it is that they tried to make all of crypto securities or exchanges because they're called the S, the Securities and Exchange Commission. So everything they see is either a security or an exchange. Crypto is not like that. It's a different thing. It's a different animal. And the U.S. has just been very, very slow to figure it out, to regulate it and to set the right uh, rules and, and structures so that we can continue to innovate. Tim, do you uh, think the <laughs> Tim, U.S. Tim. has been the center of innovation for all these years and all of a sudden we're losing it. We're losing it to all these countries who are a little bit more fleet of foot and they're coming and they're saying, hey, <clears throat> bring your bring your uh, your Bitcoin company to our country. We don't have all those uh, ridiculous regulations that are 80 something years old, 83 years old. We have we have a new set of regulations. They've all been set up for crypto. We know what the rules are, and here they are. And if you're an entrepreneur, this is the way you can play. Tim, um, in the U.S., you don't know how to play. I was kind of liking how Tim Draper was uh, not letting them get in a word in edgewise that he just uh, you know wanted to finish his thought. You know, essentially saying the SEC regulators in the U.S. are ruining it for everybody in the United States, and you know that uh, by extension is going to affect. Uh, you know, I think it's going to have an effect widely on, um, I don't know on what yet, but globally, I think it could in fact hinder business. Let's not forget cryptocurrency isn't just trading cryptos. 
you know, there's blockchain development, different kinds of industries are looking to uh, integrate different types of blockchains for different types of purposes. So this goes way beyond just, uh, you know, is a crypto a security? Is it not a security? And so to that point, guys, we recently did get the library case. James K. Filan posted this in the library case. The court has issued its decision on the remedies portion of the case. Jungle Inc. retweeting this out. Essentially, here is one of the decisions they made because the SEC does not seek relief against third-party purchases of LBC. So this is with regards to their LBC token. I also decline both library and the Amakai's invitation to rule on whether LBC is itself a security. Simply put, that issue has not been litigated in this case. So they are not uh, going to decide on whether uh, secondary sales specifically are securities. Accordingly, I take no position on whether the registration requirement applies to secondary market offerings of LBC by persons or entities that are not subject to the injunction pursuant of Rule 65D. Jungle Inc. commenting on that the SEC points to the library case to show tokens on the secondary market are securities, but the judge in the case refuses to make a ruling on this issue. So the judge is not giving any kind of indication as to what he felt were securities in the library's case. He wants to be played a puppet. What can we do? Hopefully we get better luck in the Ripple case. And, uh, you know, for a lot of us, we were thinking maybe we would get some kind of indication on where the markets were going to go or where, where the, not the markets, the rules were going to go in terms of, uh, you know, what U.S. courts were going to say about secondary sales of cryptos. And maybe Judge Torres may have taken that indication to do the same. Uh, JLFC down here saying, can Judge Torres say the exact same or does she have to address the secondary sales? Jungle Link responding, she likely does the same, but maybe we get lucky. She seems more open to the issue. So will we get lucky? Will she be more open to the issue? We've got, uh, you know, pretty much every XRP lawyer out in full force giving their opinion. Fred Rispoli here responding, Judge Torres has to address it as Ripple raised the issue in its second affirmative defense in its answer to SEC's amended complaints. Uh, he says, to be clearer, she has to address, is XRP a security? And that would, by definition, involve some discussion on secondary sales. But how deep that discussion goes is up for debate. So according to Fred Rispoli, she has to address this. But then it's going to mean, you know, to what degree does she address it? Does she address it, you know, in the same way that the uh, the library judge addresses it, kind of says, I'm going to address it, but not make any kind of distinction on it. John Deaton here also commenting, I asked the judge to clarify that the token itself is not a security, just as Judge Castle did in Telegram. He declined to do so because he said that specific issue wasn't litigated and he believes in exercising judicial restraint. He wrote, it suffices to say that merely holding LBC or purchasing it for consumptive purposes is insufficient to bring third parties within the purview of the injunction. He said, I take no position on whether the registration requirement applies to secondary market offerings of LBC by persons or entities not subject to the injunction. So he chose to punt the issue, says John Deaton. I'm disappointed the judge wasn't more aggressive like he was in the November and January hearings, but he chose to be super conservative. The SEC can't argue his decision uh, applies to the secondary market, however... That's better than nothing. David Schwartz chimed in down here. It's at least a victory that it was made clear that ordinary use of the token doesn't violate the injunction. So that's a good point. But Bill Morgan here disagrees respectfully, John. I don't think it's better than nothing, he says. It is exactly what the SEC wants. It does not want the issue of secondary market sales or the issue whether the tokens themselves are securities decided until decisions are made in the cases against the exchanges. To your great credit, you try to make it more difficult for the judge in the library case to avoid the issue and have definitely made it more difficult for Judge Torres to avoid the issue. So that's at least good. But we have to be frank that Judge Torres can avoid the issue. So, you know, there's still the possibility that Judge Torres could avoid the issue. There's a big risk. Uh, the Ripple matter will go to trial without the judge giving any clarification on whether XRP itself is a security. So uh, I guess I would go to the Supreme Court. I say it's better than nothing because the Coinbase case, the SEC cited the library uh, judge's summary judgment opinion and argued that he made no distinction between direct sales from the issuer, library, and secondary sales on exchanges. This implies the judge considered them all sales of securities. At least now, Coinbase can say it doesn't mean that uh, and his order doesn't apply to those transactions, not claiming it's a sweeping victory by any means, uh, but I believe it's better than just having the original decision out there. So, John Deaton, um, you know, quantifying that, Bill Morgan saying, fair enough, I agree. When I said it's not better than nothing in mind, I meant in relation to the Ripple case, 
So another good point, Ashley Prosper here also commenting, not ruling on secondary sales of LBC tokens may in fact be a blessing in disguise. Well, how so, Ashley? All eyes now shift to Judge Torres, who will rule on XRP in the secondary market because the SEC included it in its overboard approach to Ripple. So she's saying, you know, because the SEC made such a big deal about it, the judge is going to have to address it in some way, shape, or form, similar to what we heard earlier. Since we know Judge Torres excluded the SEC expert who opined that what XRP holders were thinking when they purchased XRP, and we know that the SEC failed to produce any individual investment contracts, I assume she has already rejected the SEC's inclusion of secondary sales. So Ashley Prosper here, uh, you know, staying cautiously optimistic. Sherry down here responding, it's anyone's guess if uh, she will rule on secondary market sales or not. Fingers crossed. Uh, excellent point, says Jack Chester. So, you know, there are other people here, you know, giving their opinions. And uh, I mean, I guess we just don't know what's going on in the judge's head. We can only best guess. The way I see it, she says, the SEC expert says this, when XRP holders bought XRP, they were relying on Ripple's efforts to increase the XRP price. And Judge Torres could retort, you can't tell me what XRP holders were thinking when you didn't speak to any of them. Plus, you admit that if you had, it may have changed your report. Besides, I have about 3,000 affidavits from actual XRP holders that contradict your conclusion. If that wasn't enough, I have about 15 Amakai briefs, several of which prove that at least some holders of the XRP token were in fact using it and not just speculating on price. Furthermore, the SEC has failed to produce a single investment contract between Ripple and these XRP holders. So a lot of good points here that Ashley makes uh, with regards to the true hard facts. Accordingly, at least one of the prongs of the Howey test has not been met. Thus, XRP sold on the secondary market does not constitute the sale of a security. The end. I mean, this is very clear cut uh, and I wish it goes down this way, but you know, <laughs> Ashley's not a lawyer I mean, respectfully, Ashley's not a lawyer, but she does have some really good insight on what, I mean, logically using common sense should happen, but we know the legal system is imperfect and uh, we can see that the XRP lawyers are likely pointing to, dare I say, a possible different outcome. She goes on to say, I can't see how Judge Torres concludes that secondary sales of XRP are securities. That I think is probably true, not with all of the above weighing on her. And I mean, you know, in a perfect world, if we worked it out and it were common sense, Ashley, I would 100% agree with you. I am a little bit worried that, uh, you know, the precedent setting or lack thereof in the library case could affect this. So I wanted to thank Ashley for posting this and Bill Morgan and John Deaton, of course, Fred Rispoli. Let me continue, guys. Another one here from Bill. No help from the market from this decision on whether LBC token itself is a security. The judge sidestepped the issue and didn't entertain the major questions doctrine. The whole case achieved nothing except harm to one company and its employees. So much for clarity through the courts. So, you know, we were hoping we would get a little bit more clarity from the library case, of course. But, you know, it seems as though these judges are uh, just happy to pass the buck. There is a real risk. Judge Torres will also sidestep dealing with the issue whether XRP itself is a security in the Ripple case. I have always been pessimistic she would do so, although I accept there is more chance she will deal with it than Judge Barbadoro. This is tragic, says Wendy O, and uh, Bill just responding to that. Yet we know from the SEC's recent filing in the Coinbase case that its theory is that the tokens itself are securities they avoided litigating the issue in the library and Ripple cases to avoid giving the court an opportunity to rule on the issue and give the market clarity. So guys, there's a bigger game being played here. Again, I love Ashley's perspective on this, but um, we know this is a game that uh, lawyers play very well. And the SEC's lawyers, of course, are going to try tooth and nail to get their way. Jeremy Hogan also pointing this out, okay? The final ruling is out for the SEC versus library. The judge did not rule on secondary sales or not surprisingly, the major questions doctrine, he enjoined further violations and issued a penalty. Is a similar result possible in the Ripple case? And Jeremy Hogan says, yes, possible, but the court would have to find that there is not enough to the fair notice defense to have a trial on the issue. Also, the court would have to find that past and present sales of XRP are investment contracts in order to provide injunctive relief. The injunctive relief would be a big problem for Ripple since it would enjoin sales from escrow but it's a problem uh, with a possible solution, just a workaround that might interfere with Ripple's business plans. No ruling on secondary market sales is a status quo ruling. So judge playing it safe again, uh, coming from Jeremy Hogan, meaning that I don't think Coinbase would relist, uh, but I don't think other exchanges would delist either. So it's basically kind of staying stagnant. It's not that other cryptocurrency exchanges are going to delist XRP, but 
you know, it doesn't give enough impetus for the, uh, you know, current American exchanges to relist it. What I don't like is the defense the judge shows to the SEC in this final paragraph and his failure to understand the confusion in the marketplace. Very disappointing. And Jeremy Hogan just highlights this. Under the circumstances, I find that the imposition of a maximum statutory amount for a first tier penalty is appropriate, especially since library's misconduct continued after the SEC's position on the registration requirement became clear. Its violation is more egregious than a simple unregistered offering. The penalty is also necessary to deter library and others from conducting unregistered offerings while also taking into account library's representations that it is without funds to pay a larger fine. So in conclusion, Jeremy Hogan says this ruling and indeed this case provides little market guidance and has protected no one. So like he says, a status quo ruling, uh, you know, passing the buck along. In fact, it hurt all the people involved. It's just another feather in the SEC's hat. That is all. So I guess we're not really getting much from the library case, at least in terms, uh, you know, how it will relate to Judge Torres's possible decision in the Ripple case. Positively, though, guys, I want to always look at the silver lining because on the positive side, Weezy at Nerd Nation unboxing, I'm confident Judge Torres knows about ETHgate. Think about all the ETHgate stuff that's been uncovered, right, guys? And has possibly even seen some of the stuff we've uncovered. This was her response from a question asked at her confirmation. She may also have been waiting for the library case to end. This Friday will be interesting to see if anything comes out. Most likely not, but he's keeping his fingers crossed. And what he's referring to is this, okay? The question, as a judge, you have experience deciding cases and writing opinions. Please describe how you reach a decision in cases that come before you and what uh, sources of information do you look for guidance? And Judge Torres responded here, I consider the written submissions of the parties and the oral arguments, if any. If necessary, and here's where it's important, I conduct additional research to identify the relevant legal provisions and governing precedents. So guys, the ETHgate stuff, chances are the judge likely knows at least some of the stuff that the XRP community has uncovered. Then I apply the law to the facts and in that way decide the case. I would continue to follow these practices if confirmed as a district judge. So that was uh, Annalisa Torres's answer. Let's also not forget what Judge Netburn said when proceedings were occurring. This courtesy of Riz XRP here on Twitter during Ripple's legal counsel, Matthew Solomon's presentation, Judge Netburn asked if having a utility specifically distinguished XRP from the other two crypto assets. And here was the answer. It might not be relevant to the issue, but it's important to understand. My understanding of XRP is that not only does it have a current value, but it also has a utility and that utility distinguishes it, I think, from Bitcoin and Ether. Is that correct? So clarifying her uh, her response there, of course, XRP does have a utility. There's a lot to consider when it comes to the strength of Ripple's argument. I'm hoping the judge realizes that. But I guess we're still just going to have to wait. That's just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.